Have you ever been on a bus or a train, rolling through a sketch area, and you think to yourself, man, what if this thing broke down right now? And then it does break down, and you crack your pants. Vehicles have offered us not just ways to traverse vast distances, but also the ability to remain relatively safe while doing so. Back in the old days, you either had to go by foot or by horse, which left you horrifically exposed to anything waiting in the darkness that could grab you, rob you, or even eat you. Sometimes all three. But over time, human technology and travel got more sophisticated. We built roads, and unless you're on a bike, we surrounded ourselves with a sturdy metal cage and glass in which to move across areas that otherwise would creep you out quite heavily, seeing as, uh, you know, you're in the safety of your mobile room, you really don't have anything to worry about. In some sense, this has been fantastic, more so because by the time you watch this, I will have done this myself and driven across the entire North American continent from Atlanta, Georgia to Seattle, Washington, all because I hate flying. But it's not lost on me the second I step out of the car, any manner of person could be out there, which is why I stay strapped at all times on those trips. But in jolly old Europe, they do not appear to maintain the same mentality. As a group of younglings are being driven across a pretty sketch forest, straight up Halloween forest actually, they are forced to venture off the beaten path due to obstacles in the way. As they do, they are quickly hijacked by an infamous criminal who hunts these roads and eats tongues. You're probably thinking, but Roanoke, how is this guy a monster? Well, that's because the real monsters, at least in our lives, are humans, and that's our only natural predator as we know of. But, with that said, in our imaginations, there are worse things out there. As they enter the tunnel, the bus breaks down as they spot something sitting just beyond the edge of their lights. As the driver approaches it, it becomes apparent that not only is this thing hostile, but it's a man-eater as well as it becomes a fight for survival. But the question is, what is this creature and where did it come from? Well, let's discuss that in today's episode over the movie Shortcut. And also, uh, I just got dunked on a lot in my last video, people calling me Indian Explain. I have no idea who that is. Uh, but I'm gonna have to go look him up because it sounds like he's got pretty interesting content. Ah, oh, didn't see you there. Thank you guys for watching. I really do appreciate you checking out this video. If you like it, then please like as it gets it out in the algorithm. And if you really like the channel, uh, feel free to subscribe. I upload like once or twice a week at this point. So there's always new content coming out down the pipeline and enjoy. So we kick off our story staring at some grass branches and spider webs. We're in a forest as someone runs through wearing we all float down here jacket. As he moves through, he clearly is in distress and reading about something. What could it be? Well, we're gonna find out. As an old school red bus drives through a similar looking forest from the looks of it, a squad of younglings heads out through a field and into a darker area of the forest. On the radio, a woman talks about the lunar eclipse that they are apparently going to see. The moon and man have been intrinsically linked for quite some time, whether it be worship of the moon or just staring at it, sometimes even blinding yourself by accident by staring at a solar eclipse, which, side note, never look at a solar eclipse unaided. While the typical pain you feel of looking at the sun normally isn't present, you can still absolutely sear your retinas permanently blinding yourself in that particular area of your sight. Which, if you're looking at something, that's typically your central vision. You don't want that. I almost did that a few years back looking at a partial solar eclipse that swung through Georgia. I looked at it for like, quite literally two seconds. I felt no pain, but I had a nice blind spot in my vision for about 40 minutes which I'm sure won't come back to haunt me at all. And if you think I'm stupid for that, I counter with Isaac Newton did the same thing. Anyhow, so the radio goes off and it's clear the group is headed through the woods for the reason of viewing this lunar eclipse. This has gotta be some sort of camp thing because you could probably just see this from your backyard. The group then talks about the lunar eclipse and the usual suspects are all here, Nolan, Bess, Reggie, Queenie, and Carl with their driver, Joseph. Reggie is sitting in the back being a pizza cutter, all edge, no point. He throws a can at Nolan as obviously they're at least somewhat friends. Nolan has the hots for Bess, the redhead next to him, and Carl is up front. Nolan and Carl appear to be friends, and Queenie is the girl with the glasses. So now this is filmed in Italy, but I think it's supposed to take place in England given the accents. Uh, this is never really said. Also, Joseph has an American accent. Also, the murderer has an American accent. I have no idea where this takes place. The driver then drops a riddle for everyone to keep them quiet, as most adults do. See, back in the day, road trips with my dad would just be, uh, give me and my brother's Dramamine, which would knock us unconscious for like five hours, so that we could actually make some headway on road trips without fighting. And now I do that with my wife. So, the riddle goes as such. Seven letters in my name, being a tough guy is my game. Neither monsters, storms, nor dragons can stop me, even without my weaponry. Now ponder my words carefully. Virtue and nobility are nothing without fear. Even for the king of kings, him with the golden mane, he who thanks to me can live, roar, and reign. Who am I? And if you know, don't wait till the end. Drop it in the comments now because I pay attention to the first 15 minutes of comments usually, and then later I come back. But I'll know if you cheated. So everyone shuts up for a minute thinking, as I swear this bus keeps heading into darker and darker woods the whole time. And moving through the road, it now gets narrower as they find a tree that has blocked the path. This disturbs the driver a little bit, but he backs up and then finds a secondary path as we zoom out. We then see a hand in the woodpile. 
See, we in the business like to call this a trap. And not just an internet trap, but like a real trap that'll get you uh, totally destroyed. It's sort of a similar concept to someone stopping in front of you and getting out of their car with the intention of robbing you. Your natural instinct may be to back up, but I promise you, turn them into bowling pins and gun it, and you will feel a lot better about running somebody over. All I can think of is that saying that's like, do you really value your property over someone's life? If it's a thief, yeah. I do. Oh, another one, just so you have the information on this, is people will put boards with nails over the road. Uh, they want you to get out and move the boards so that they can rob you. If you ever see something like that in the road that looks deliberate, never get out and move it. Uh, that's how you get got. Unless you are in a car full of people who are all strapped and they are ready to rock because you just never know what's out there. If you do have the ladder though, get out and beat some wholesale ass. So they turn off the gravel road, exiting through the forest, and they are heading into a fog now, which doesn't bode well for the lunar eclipse viewing. Now in a foggy forest, it looks extra spooky. I love it. They approach a deer in the road where we see the first horrible idea by the driver. It's a deer. Swing around it. But instead the driver gets out and then we see his second horrible idea, instead of moving it just enough to get it out of the way, to, you know, go around, he decides to carry the deer literally the entire way, like, way back out in the forest, apparently back to its home in the forest. Like, there was no need to pull it this far into the woods, but as he does, a force multiplier gets pulled on him. Again, you didn't need to drag it that far out, you were just asking for this to happen. Like, even a bear could have been out there or something. But I digress. Back at the bus, the younglings talk about riding a pig for some reason, as the driver comes back and Caretaker from Scary Movie 2 shows up as well. As he wields a force multiplier with his strong hand, he warns the younglings that the driver will drive and they will get out of there. As Carl looks at the guy, he recognizes him. Carl then has a flashback to telling, like, like some dude, I imagine it's probably his father, it's never really explicitly said, that he saw another guy try to kiss a woman who didn't want it, and he stopped it by punching them, like it's real Giga Chad stuff, like not even ironically. Of course, Carl could be lying to make himself sound more heroic, and in the process of telling the story, he sees Pedro Minghella, or let's be real and use his real name here, he is really the caretaker named Hansen. I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. So I will be referring to him by his real name from now on. He takes out his victims and eats their tongues, as well as ruins dinners by just shoving his hand in any of the food yelling my turn. He also loves younglings around this age, so that's not ideal for this group. Driving through the night, Hansen then tells everyone to throw their phones out the window, which it took him a long time to actually say this. Anybody could have made a call and let their phone go at that point. And as the British have informed me, they could have just called 112 and let their phones get tracked. Reggie resists though, as he's trying to be the hardcore rebel, and Reggie eventually though relents, gives up his phone mainly because he doesn't want an extra hole in his face from here. Joseph continues driving, and as they do, they approach a sign that they can't see that says Military Zone. Except it's overgrown, indicating that this is a really old, decommissioned fort in a military zone. Why a road is going through this, I have no idea. The younglings at this point all look at the handhelds and attempt to figure out who's going to run at him. Hansen turns around, kind of noticing this, and asks Nolan what his name is, and says it sounds like it's out of a comic book. See, Hansen stole his first comic book, so he's broken from factory. It's time to send him back. Approaching a tunnel, it is completely abandoned as the bus comes to a stop. Now, given that we know we have just entered an abandoned military installation, again, you have to ask yourself, why are we here, and why would the road go through this area? Like, for real. If this is a road that's pretty much well-traveled, why would it go through the heart of a military base, and if the base is abandoned, why do the lights still work? Doesn't matter, the movie's pretty cool regardless. Hansen freaks out a little and tells Joseph to go fix the bus, but that thing ain't turning over. Joseph exits the bus and starts messing with the engine, and the group talks about trying to disarm Hansen, but they need to wait for the right moment. As Joseph reports the issue, Hansen freaks out about the engine. So, here's the thing. If you're driving along and your engine stops, it could be a multitude of things. You need spark, fuel, and compression for an engine to run, compression basically being air. If those just randomly go out while driving, uh, that would indicate likely a fuel issue as the lights still run and the engine didn't have some catastrophic blowout. So likely the fuel pump went out while driving, or there's a clog in the filter. Either way, it's a little more involved than just messing with the engine. This is why serial killers are the worst. Their knowledge of cars are subpar, and they honestly need to get good. As they sit there with Hansen reeing over the engine, the lights switch off. They look out in front of the bus, and just beyond the lights, they see a figure sitting there. Hansen tells Joseph to go, like, get that thing out of here. Uh, okay, bro. Like, mm, you're the one that has, like, the weapon here, so why don't you go do it? But Joseph approaches it, and I'd rather go with the action. Here, have rock on this one. That is, after all, what makes our species better than literally everything else on this planet. Throwing a rock is our God-given right. As Joseph walks up to it, he can hear it growling. It stands up and is at least a entire head and shoulders taller than him. 
and we don't really get a good look at it at this point, but we will soon enough. Hansen gets back on the bus freaking out as he orders Carl to go out there and get the keys in the darkness. Nolan stands up to go get the keys, but Bess beats him to the task. She slowly approaches Joseph's body. His neck has been torn open and he appears to have pretty much been bled out quite quickly in a short amount of time. She grabs his keys and she hears something in the darkness. Using her flashlight, she spots the thing looking at her from around the corner as it retreats from the light. As she runs back, they try to start up the bus, but Bess tells them Joseph looks like he was ripped open by some sort of animal or something. Reggie then starts trying to get the vehicle moving, but again, it's likely a fuel pump issue as they are able to pull the handheld from Hansen. He didn't have it in his strong hand. So here's the thing. If someone is going to pull something like a force multiplier on you and you somehow get it out of their hands, you need to use it immediately. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, don't sit there and cry, breaking Benjamin that dude and blow him away because if he's able to get it back, you are shown that you will fight, so you are now number one on the list of Dunzos. Hansen knows that they won't do anything, though, and unfortunately, Reggie isn't as hardcore as he believes, so he won't pull the trigger on our sweet, innocent tongue eater here. So Hansen gets it back and hears something on the roof. As he comes out to check what it is, he walks around, but he can't see anything. Calling out to it, actually just taunting it, he eventually spots it as it grabs him and drags him to the roof. He fires a shot, but it does nothing. And it also sounds like it was just a BB gun shot, because that, that is not what they sound like. So either he missed, or this thing is way more durable than you might initially think. Carl then has a freak out at this point as arguments erupt on what they're supposed to do as the thing shows up to the window, and we get a good look at my handsome boy. Uh, this guy has seen better days. But let's cover the morphology of his face real quick as a hint as what we were dealing with here. First, the skin is darker and pigmented black, potentially to blend in with the environment that it hunts, which is either apparently old forts or more likely night. The mouth is interesting as it's shaped with a standard mandible that is seen on humans, but the teeth are fine needles. These teeth are used to bite into flesh as clearly it uses blood as sustenance, which we will get into the intestinal biochemistry of how it uses this blood in a moment. The gums of this creature are also black as well, which is interesting as it indicates this is not just a skin tone, but a pigmentation that likely runs all throughout the body. The skin is wrinkled and the creature appears older. This will make sense in a few minutes. The nose is blunted for the most part, and it's pretty much gone. This would be an adaptation of sorts as this allows for the mouth to get closer to the skin of its intended prey, as the end of its nose would just get in the way if it were there, say, in a human form. Like, you ever try to give someone a hickey? It's a similar concept. And yes, I too was 16 at one point in time. The eyes are massive, clearly showing this creature hunts in absolute darkness, and shows why it's so susceptible to bright lights. What's strange is the eyes actually sit further away from one another, almost giving it a prey-like appearance as opposed to a predator. But that's really not a hard and fast rule either. The eyes are deep onyx black, showing no iris, and really indicating it must all be pupil. Because of the size that they are, this creature can likely pick up any light available in the area to see perfectly fine in what I would assume is pitch black. It's much like how night vision works, and because of this, just like how night vision works, if you flip the lights on, it's blinding. The brow ridge of this creature is massive. It appears that muscle actually sits central between the eyes more so than what can be found in humans. In fact, its entire side profile of its face indicates that there may have been skull growth pushing the face forward considerably by about a half inch or so. In fact, given the skull shape, this creature does appear to have been related to Homo sapiens, which brings into question what it even is. The hairline has receded back to about mid-scalp, but the hair is long and scraggly, but the fact that it's growing at all indicates primate. This clearly suggests that this thing is also a mammal of sorts, but we will get more into its hypothesized origins here in a moment. Holding Hansen's head up to the glass to show everyone, look, I saved you, the entire bus starts screaming. Well, at least that problem solved. Like, actually, what if the creature is just horrifically misunderstood? I'm gonna be real with you. This would have activated my almonds back into ape mode, so it really wouldn't matter. I mean, I get it. Time to just ooga dooga on it. Reggie starts making some noise to try to get everyone's attention, but they try to figure out what they should do with this thing right outside the bus. During the debate, the radio comes on as Reggie looks out the back of the bus and sees nothing but then the lights start flickering. So now we get some really weird spaz out moment where Reggie sees his friends and himself covered in blood as the creature attacks. Interesting to say the least, to be able to affect radio frequencies and beam ideas into people's heads. So what's that about? So there are several things happening that are strange and seem too connected to just be coincidence. First and foremost, the bus stopping. As far as we all know, that is supposed to just be an occurrence, but reality is, considering it falls in line with everything else happening, there's no way it's not connected. The bus stopping would indicate that electrically, unless this was a mechanical fuel pump, which is more likely 
given that engine, but it also could be a modern engine swap, it would be affected to the point of stopping fuel. Now, all in all, it could have been a coincidence, but I kind of doubt it. Second, the light shut off. This creature may have shut off the lights before entering the tunnel to draw in the prey, but as we will come to find out, light injures the thing pretty badly, or at least has enough power to like run it off. This would mean that it would need to know to shut off the power, which given the time frame it's been in the fort is also completely possible. But when it comes to the radio, that is the strangest part. Why would the radio randomly click on with static when the creature gets close? And how would this be like possibly pertaining to the monster placing visions to the point of incapacitating them for a few seconds? Well, we'll discuss momentarily. So then they hear scratching on the side of the bus as they see a hand entering the bus. Player 3 has entered the game. Getting on the bus, this thing then corners them, but they're able to use light to blind it as clearly it doesn't enjoy that. Looking at it within the bus, we can begin to get an idea of how tall this thing actually is. For instance, Joseph was supposed to be around 6 feet tall, or about 183 centimeters. When the creature stood up, it was a full head and shoulders taller, so we can assume it's at least a foot taller, meaning this creature is somewhere in the range of 6 foot 9 to 7 foot 3, or between 205.7 to 220.9 centimeters, rivaling the height of Master Chief. Its hands possess large nails and they have turned into claws at this point, but the hands themselves are very much so human. Getting out of the bus, they then spot Hansen as he's got his brain sucked out as this thing bit into his skull, as they run over to a door in the wall to escape the creature. Running down some stairs, they enter some tunnels and shut the door behind them. Having a nice jaunt through the unknown abandoned fort, they have no idea where they were going, but they start to slow down thinking they lost it, which rule number one of any monster encounter Never assume you lost it. Assume it's like a persistence hunter like yourself and out persistence it. But they continue through as they spot a room that has candles as it appears as though it was inhabited at one point in time, probably by a hobo. They then find a floor plan indicating that this was some old military fort, but and you already knew that. They then light candles and take a rest for a moment as they gather a plan. Taking a look at the floor plan, they see that there is an exit point as well as an area where they can turn on the power. This inspires Bess and Nolan to head out there to get the power turned on. Meanwhile, back at home base, they talk about some non-descriptive nonsense as the group then starts getting on one another's nerves. Queenie says that she needs to go pee, so then they need to go out there with her, so Reggie takes her as Carl plays the air drums. Nolan and Bess at this point then find a bunch of lights that are inoperable, and this gives Nolan an idea. It couldn't stand lights in the bus, so it looks like someone had already tried to take this thing out. Turning on the power should expose the creature to some holy light to flush it out or at least brighten up the place a little bit. You know, real paladin activities. Of course, their training is nil, so really it's squire activities. Hi, welcome to the channel. I'm actually a huge nerd here. While that's going on, Reggie creepily won't turn around while Queenie's trying to go pee. Alright bro, a little weird. But he has the hots for her. Still standing by my original statement though, that is weird. While his back is turned, he then calls out to her, but she's nowhere to be seen. Running through, he has lost her completely, even though she was like a foot away. Running back to Carl, he tells him what happened. Meanwhile, back over at Nolan and Bess, they find more evidence someone was hunting this thing. They then find the power switch. While that's going on, Reggie and Carl then run around trying to find Queenie, as then they spot her with the monster on her neck. So here we see it actively feeding, and this indicates a few things to us. First, Queenie is going to need to be put on like a round of antibiotics and get up to date on her tetanus shots, but this doesn't appear to be some form of contractable disease. Instead, this creature is just as it is, and how did it come to be? Well, the easiest comparison to draw is it's simply a vampire of sorts. Given its location and long-standing lore of the vampires in the area, it should be open and shut, but therein lies the issue. This creature looks nothing like what the lore says it should, and instead, the only similarity is that it drinks blood. So let's start there before moving on to possible origins, and I guess just explain the blood drinking first. This creature is intimately familiar with humans and blood. It is entirely possible that at night it will come out of the fort and hunt the surrounding area. So you have to ask yourself, that arm we saw on the pile of sticks, was that the work of Hansen or something else? Head Cannon says to me it was the creature hunting. It's clear that it's been in the area for quite some time as we will come to find out, but initially I believe the worker was working to clear trees where he was taken out. Because while they did take a gravel road, they ended back up on another main road, and given the time that passed, I doubt Hansen would have been able to walk that far. Because of this, in my mind, I think the creature had drained that dude. Though the only caveat to this is why was he covered up? But why would Hansen walk so far away on the off chance someone might get redirected and come down that road specifically? The drinking of blood is something to humans that is also not very useful outside of very specific survival situations to potentially rehydrate yourself, but it does indicate something interesting about this creature. First thing to note about the blood is it has a tremendous amount of protein in it, which can cause a multitude of issues for you. Drinking blood can cause your kidneys to shut down for starters as it damages them. It can also cause you to consume a dangerous level of iron, leading to a condition known as hemochromatosis, 
Along with this, there is a ton of salt in it, which can lead to hypertension. But essentially, humans are not built to process blood in our digestive tract, as we lack the bacteria to break down this blood. If you didn't know, it's not just our bodies that work to process what we eat, but the microbiome housed within our guts to help break down food. Vampire bats, for instance, have this biome that can break down blood, and an anticoagulant known as draculin that prevents blood from clotting. On top of this, the same bacteria can synthesize vitamins in order to keep their bodies stable, despite the evident lack of nutrition from what they are drinking. Rounding back to this guy, we see he drinks only blood. I would also have to assume that he must have a similar microbiome in his guts that is beyond what humans have, allowing him to basically consume blood and synthesize nutrition. But the question here becomes, what is he? I believe there was a combination of genetics to create this thing. Which I'm about to blue ball y'all because uh, we have to wrap up this last part of the movie because it gives us more information. He attacks the thing with fire as Reggie gets grabbed and his torch gets extinguished. Carl then grabs Queenie and then runs as the creature tries to move on Reggie. Luckily for him though, Nolan and Bess get the power turned on just in time, injuring the creature or at least frightening it as it runs from the light. Nolan and Bess look around the room that they're seeing and find that someone was definitely living here, some form of hunter, as the thing's movements are mapped out and all the people that it's taken out are newspaper clippings on the wall. You know, some real like Winchester stuff, except this hunt appears to have gone really badly considering it's still alive and this guy's nowhere to be found. They then find a journal where they find a picture of two younglings. As Nolan and Bess walk back, they meet up with the rest of the group looking a little worse for wear. The thing left sucker marks on Queenie's neck, but it doesn't appear to be bleeding too terribly. They then spot the hunter in a small area of the wall completely desiccated. Reading his journal, it says him and his sister would go on adventures. His sister entered the old military fort, spotting the creature as she was dragged in. He didn't go after his sister, instead running as he was afraid, which was the guy from earlier, and I mean, what really could he have done? Now he's an old man. He's entered the fort in order to find this thing and take it out to avenge his sister. Setting up shop, he mapped out the area and got ready to hunt this thing by creating multiple light traps and keeping a journal of its weaknesses. They learn it feeds on human blood like a parasite, and back over at the flashback, the creature then ends up finding the guy and showing us what happened. Apparently, it enters the shop as it is either attracted to radio signals, like by feeling them, or it just heard his radio, but I think it's attracted to radio signals, and then entered his shop and drained him of blood. Given the age of the man, he was most definitely in his 60s, probably mid to late 60s when he got got. So we'll just say average 68. When he was younger, I would say he was between about 11 to 14, and we will say that he was around 12, because when those teenage years hit, uh, you don't want to go on adventures with your sister anymore. That means roughly about 56 years have passed that the same creature was still in there. This creature was also likely in, in its adult stage by the time it attacked his sister, and was still an adult at the time that it attacked this new set of younglings. We do not know if it ages like a normal human, but we can assume the military fort was only more recently abandoned around this time. What I think it is, is that this creature is a chimera of sorts, but was created for a specific purpose. This appears to be an intentional combination of a human genome spliced with specific vampire gene loci. Sounds kind of crazy when you start looking at it, but uh, considering the traits it has, maybe it's not so crazy. First, have you ever really seen a vampire bat's face? The eyes will sit further apart with a large squashed nose and large ears as well. While the ears in this creature are hard to see, when we look at its face, we can definitely begin to see similarities between the species. The eyes are also a dead ringer considering in both this creature and a vampire bat, they are large and black. The mammalian splicing of a bat and Homo sapiens already being a mammal as well would account for the hair growth that we see, and much like a bat with its needle-like teeth, this creature also has needle teeth. The brow ridge is also reminiscent of a vampire bat's as well. This would help to explain its bloodlust as bats need very little blood, but are always hunting. Human-sized creatures may need a considerable more amount of blood to stay alive and would prefer to feed on live prey as well, much like what they are doing with everyone that attacks. Its feeding was interrupted with Queenie, but considering it already drained Hansen and Joseph, uh, not good. Anyways, Queenie also has a pale appearance after this and likely it's also taken a quite a bit of her blood. But the next question is, why create this thing in the first place? Well, we're in a military base and it may have been possible that around this time before the base was abandoned and likely an effort for whoever, you know, greenlit this program to distance themselves from it, the experiments concerning humans were to try to give soldiers the ability to see in the dark. Now take this with a grain of salt because all of this is unestablished lore, but with a program like this going on, one appears to have either gotten loose prior to the place being abandoned, which resulted in everyone getting out as not to be implicated with this abomination's creation, or the experiments were abandoned and left to their fate that result in one getting out. 
It may also be that there are still like a hive of these things with other experimental forms down there somewhere deeper within the base. And from what we will see here momentarily, it's entirely possible. Overall, I believe that this is some sort of experiment of genetic splicing. This is clearly a human mixed with a bat to form some sort of man bat. Or like a bat human. Or like vampire sapiens. I don't know. There's like a name escaping me. But this resulted in a distorted human of physiological traits by poisoning of the well with a bat genome. This is why when someone is bit and escapes, they do not become a vampire like this thing because there is no disease that the person is contracting to become what they are. Instead, they were created like this. So the group then agrees to hunt this thing down and take it out using the information the original guy had. They start everything up and get ready as they then shut off the power to lure it in. As the group waits, they leave the radio running to attract it, but Carl's freaking out. So now we have to talk about how does it actually like do what it's doing? Is it feeling signals? Is it just hearing? I think because it is part bat, that it must be able to hear very, very well, and it can hear a radio very, very well. That's the only premise I can go with. Why it was able to affect electricity of the bus, I think it was more just attracted to the noise the bus was making. And as far as beaming a image into Reggie's head that he saw this, it would seem to imply that this thing has some form of telepathy, but then this is never explained again, so we can't really say with any certainty is it telepathic? Is it actually showing people? Or was Reggie just freaking out about what he saw because he essentially has PTSD at this point? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. So then they begin to hear it as it enters the room. We get a pretty good look at it as it smells the blood cloth on the ground. Vest goes to open up a switch to get the lights on, but it gets stuck, of course. They really needed a WD-40, that thing. The creature then approaches Reggie as Nolan lets out a whistle, attracting it. Moving through the passageway, it enters the room rather quickly that Nolan was in as Queenie gets his attention next. She runs and hides with Bess as it opens the door to the room they are in before it gets distracted for like the fourth time and this is probably why they didn't move ahead with this project with soldiers because the thing just got distracted too much the thing is like absolutely horrible at hide and seek as well but luring it back into the original room they're able to get the power on as carl grabs it letting the girls run out they then burst into the light as they turn and see the creature is just behind them it can't come out though as it appears as though the other three now arrive with torches as they run on it it is trapped between daylight and teenagers with torches not a good time. They light the creature on fire as it appears to succumb to the burns, falling at the entrance of the tunnel. It's at this moment that I believe there are more than one of these things in the fort, as what we will see a little, like, in, like, one minute here. But this one was left out near the light, but given that its skin is darker, I really do severely doubt UV radiation would be actually able to take out this creature just by being exposed to light. Instead, its eyes are sensitive to light, but it would survive direct sunlight if it wore, like, eye patches. However, fire, on the other hand, is a little more difficult to survive. And the reason it falls when it is lit on fire is not usually what people think. When you're lit on fire, you don't just basically succumb to burns. But upon inhaling superheated air, this can actually seriously your lungs and like fuse your alveolar sacs and inflame your bronchi and basically just lock up your lungs. So given that this is a human chimera, it still has lungs and it can still succumb to burns like this. I believe the creature that they were being actively hunted by was taken out at the tunnel entrance. So everyone is pretty jazzed at this point as they have avenged Joseph. And then at the end, they discuss the riddle. It was courage the whole time. Obviously, nobody believed their story, but the squad has now been formed. Of course, back at the fort, another group may have believed them as they approach because Joseph is still missing. I mean, that is still a thing that's real. And as they head inside, the creature lets out a growl as clearly it survived its wounds or more likely there is more than one of them out there, which is exactly what I believe is happening. And thus concludes Shortcut. The shortcut monster is one that has no backstory, no history, and to those involved in surviving against it, there is no explanation as to why it exists. However, from what we can see, this is most definitely a human mixed with the genetics of a bat, and potentially the effort to create something that would be useful for the military in its confrontations, considering it was living in a military fort that was abandoned. This one, however, appears to have gone wrong, resulting in likely the abandonment of the program, and even the entire fort as a result. But I want to hear what you guys think. Is this creature like always been there or is it something that was created by a man let me know i will drop my twitter discord patreon and roanoke tales channel links where last week we talked about the p51 mustang group called flight 19 that went missing over the bermuda triangle but speaking of patrons i'd like to thank mine real quick first i'd like to thank our astronaut rosie kinks thank you very much I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Des Dancer, as well as our scientists, Arjun Sentinel, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanations of B-grade horror movies, especially this one, Logan Satomi, Lucian Dragon, Robbie Cruz, and Tyson Nakanishi. And the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping the channel running. It is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and we'll see y'all in the next one.